You know, bloodletting went on for about 2,500 years before we figured out that this wasn't really the uh, prime therapy for all ailments, as was claimed. George Washington, as you may know, was actually bled to death. That's what he died of. Well, in some cases, the bloodletters may have hit upon some patients for whom bloodletting was beneficial if those people happen to suffer from a disease called hemochromatosis. And indeed, the solution in that case is phlebotomy or bloodletting. To speak to us about hemochromatosis, a fascinating disease, we have on the line Bob Rogers, and he's all the way out in B.C., Prince George, I think. Uh, Hi, Bob. Welcome to the show. Hi, Joe. Uh, Dr. Joe, yes, I am uh, sitting in Prince George right now. We are at a show here, and we're just bringing awareness to this community and uh, building a chapter of people who have the condition. Okay, well, you're head of the Hemochromatosis Society, so uh, you are the best person to speak to about this uh, condition. And uh, unfortunately, many people are just totally unaware of what it is. So perhaps we should start by you bringing us uh, kind of up to date on what hemochromatosis is all about. Sure. So hereditary hemochromatosis, because that's a little bit different than hemochromatosis, hemochromatosis simply means iron overload. But you can uh, inherit uh, this disorder. And what it is is a genetic condition then that affects iron metabolism. And how it affects it is that it causes the body to overload in iron. And that iron uh, absorbed from the gut goes to the liver primarily. And then if the liver can't hold uh, the amount of iron that's being absorbed, uh, and the bone marrow is saturated with the iron, then it goes to vital organs in the body like the heart or the pancreas, joint tissues, skin tissues, uh, the brain. And once iron gets there, because it doesn't belong there, it starts to cause uh, symptoms, uh, illnesses, and disease that uh, can be uh, very disruptive in a person's life, make them feel horrible. And in some cases, like the heart or the liver, it can be potentially fatal. Now, how prevalent is uh, hereditary hemochromatosis? According to the AIR study that was done by Dr. Paul Adams, uh, who's a leading researcher in this field and a gastroenterologist out of London Health Sciences Center in Ontario, uh, one in 300 people in Canada have uh, are at risk to have these two genes, which makes it the most common genetic disorder in Canada. Now, as I understand it, um, just because you have inherited both genes does not necessarily mean that you will have the condition. That's correct. The expression of the disorder, we don't know exactly what the expression of it is, but the estimate is around 75%. And those at greatest risk for this disorder uh, are uh, along the inheritance line or the ancestral line of Celts and Europeans. So you see in Montreal, for example, where you have a high French population and you also have a European population and you have a Celtic population, you are going to have a, a large number of those ethnicities that are going to be at risk. That's now going to bring it down to about 1 in 225. Now, I, I suppose that it is um, generally quite a long time until this diagnosis is arrived at because the symptoms are, are similar to what you would find with numerous other conditions. You know, I mean, joint pain and then uh, arrhythmia and uh, tiredness, all of that. I mean, they could be symptomatic of dozens of diseases. Dr. Joe, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the average uh, length of time to a uh, diagnosis is five to ten years. And uh, because the physician, in this case, has to be suspicious that the reason why his or her patient has these symptoms uh, or disease uh, could be caused by an underlying condition. Yet, the tests for this condition are so simple, covered under any provincial medical program, and there needs to be more 
screening at the clinical level of those people who could be potentially at risk and show up with two or more of these symptoms. Now, a, a, a general blood test, which is ordered by physicians like for a checkup, would not include the test. I, I assume that you're talking about the ferritin test. Yes, right. no, they're not done. First of all, they're not done in the normal annual checkup or in a CBC, a complete blood count. They're not uh, in that. Uh, the doctor has to order them specifically, the serum ferritin uh, and or the transferrin saturation percentage. And to make it even harder, the physician needs to write uh, on the lab request or check a box on the lab request that says that he or she is suspicious of hemochromatosis or else the lab might not do the uh, test properly. Mm -hmm. So if you're just going for a checkup, uh, it would not not be possible to just ask the doctor to, to do this if there's no, no suspicion. Well, you know, I, I, it's very hard in the uh, many orphans, uh, patients who don't have family doctors. So it, it many walk into walk-in clinics, and if a patient walks into a walk-in clinic and says, or even into their family doctor and says, you know, doc, um, I've got a couple of symptoms like this. I'd like to, you know, you to do a transferrin saturation percentage because I was talking to those people in the Canadian Hemochromatosis Society. There's some pushback sometimes, or or a sense of a lack of awareness or suspicion on the doctor's mind that uh, that often says, well, you know, you, you don't have this. Well, let's look at some other things. And we need to do some more continuing medical education for family physicians so that they understand how prevalent this can be. So do you think that, that uh, one should push for having this be included in a, a general blood test? You know, um, well, that's something our society would advocate. The cost of putting a uh, serum ferritin and a transferrin saturation in the CBC would be 10 bucks. And if it was administered, that option of the CBC, because there could be a variety of CBCs, right? So you could give the uh, CBC HHC uh, variety to all white uh, men and women between the ages of 20 and 35, because men get into doctors a whole lot later than women, um, we're a bit stubborn that way, mm -hmm. uh, we could pick up uh, more of the people that have this disorder. But before health, uh, provincial health uh, agencies are willing to do this, they want to see stats as long as your arm or even longer. And uh, getting them there is, is very difficult. I'm speaking to Bob Rogers, who's head of uh, the Hemochromatosis Society, and uh, we're going to take a break for traffic here, and after that we'll come back and find out what happens if someone is diagnosed with hemochromatosis. You're listening to the Dr. Joe Show, CJD 800, News Talk Radio Montreal. We will be right back. Your source when you need answers. The Dr. Joe Show on CJAD 800. How little we know. We're talking about hemochromatosis, a disease that is probably underdiagnosed here in Canada. And uh, Bob Rogers is the head of the Hemochromatosis Society. Uh, Bob, what what would be the the prime symptoms uh, affecting someone who has hemochromatosis? Well, as you mentioned at the top of the hour, um, uh, Joe, uh, Doctor Joe, the. The uh, symptoms can be somewhat uh, common, so chronic fatigue, uh, there could be some loss of body hair, there could be loss of libido, there could be uh, aches and pains of, of arthritic pain, and, you know, these are fairly common symptoms associated with many disorders. So, uh, and these are primary conditions that a family physician would look at their patient and say, oh, well, you know, if, if you're losing loss of libido, here's a prescription for Cialis or something of that kind. Or, um, or uh, if you're arthritic, then you know take some over-the-counter medicine, or I can prescribe you something. And 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 as I mentioned before, then the underlying cause isn't detected. But when we get into the serious diseases that can occur. 
type 2 diabetes, uh, heart uh, problems such as uh, arrhythmias or cardiomyopathy, which is a, uh, a disease of the muscle of the heart, uh, or uh, severe arthritis or liver uh, enzymes being high, then often the patient is referred to a specialist like a gastroenterologist or a rheumatologist or a, um, a cardiologist. And that's where the investigation gets deeper and often a serum ferritin or a transferrin saturation is done there and it's detected, but the amount of time that takes is a long time. Um, another way that this is discovered, uh, and I just met a woman today at this show that we're in here in Prince George. Her father dies 21 years ago, and he's riddled with cirrhosis and dies of cancer uh, that's metastasized from the liver. And he's, uh, you know, they posthumously do a, uh, um, uh, a biopsy of the liver to find out that there was this presence of staining on the um, uh, slide due to iron, an abundance of iron in the liver. Then the familial study gets done in order to trace the genetics through the family, and that's how people know. Great for them, sad for the father. Mm -hmm. Now, I would assume that uh, hemochromatosis increases the risk for cancer of the liver? It does, because mm -hmm. it, it uh, causes the cirrhosis, and in third and fourth stage cirrhosis, uh, cancer uh, begins, and then as that uh, goes through the lymphatic system, uh, it goes into other parts of the body. And so, yes, at, uh, people, men are dying uh, typically uh, when they have hemochromatosis in their 60s be uh, because they've got a late diagnosis in their 40s be while the damage has been done. Now, can a serum ferritin and a serum transferrin saturation test confirm the presence of hemochromatosis? Uh, no, it can. It can certainly give some... Uh, clear markers, the confirmation comes from the genetic test, the HFE gene. We've had a test since 1998, and uh, the gene uh, being identified can confirm the diagnosis if those other two uh, tests are elevated. Another test that is uh, uh, a GI, a gastroenterologist would want to do, is either to take a, a scan uh, of the liver uh, or a liver biopsy, um, but these days with the genes uh, being available and uh, non-invasive methods of scanning the liver, uh, liver mm -hmm. biopsy is less and less necessary. Okay, so let's say someone is uh, confirmed as having hemochromatosis. What is the next step in terms of treatment? Well, routinely, uh, and one of the things I want to come back to, Dr. Joe, is how it varies in men and women. But uh, if someone has hemochromatosis, uh, their ferritin would likely be above 1,000 uh, nanograms per milliliter. I've seen men with 9,000 plus as well. And so they immediately need to get into treatment, and these are therapeutic treatments where they go to a hospital and they are they do a... Uh, a, a, like a blood donation, um, about a pint of blood is withdrawn from the body, and um, and what that does is take the red blood cells out of the body, and that causes the body to go looking for iron in the body to make these new red blood cells, and so it leaches the iron out of the body through that mechanism. And eventually people de-iron and get down to a healthy level of iron for them, which uh, for, for people with hemochromatosis, which is 50 nanograms per milliliter. Then for the rest of their life, they will have to monitor their ferritin. And when they need another treatment, which is on the average every three to four months, uh, then they can go to the Canadian Blood Services and give a pint of blood uh, there, and they get well, and the blood donation goes on to save three more lives. How is it that you're interested in this uh, condition? Oh, I, 
Dr. Joe, I have been in nonprofit ever since I was 28. I'm 61 now, and uh, I was interviewed for this position six years ago, and the organization loved my passion, loved my experience, and now uh, I, I want to put a face to this cause because uh, there's too many people that are suffering needlessly. Okay, Bob, well, thanks very much for bringing us up to date on, on this, and uh, I think the information is out there, and some people will be alerted. Dr. Joe, our website is too much iron, T O O much iron dot C A, and our telephone line is 1 877 bad iron. Sounds bad. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bob. Thank you, Dr. Joe. That was Bob Rogers, head of the uh, Hemochromatosis Society, and I think it's important uh, that uh, we get this kind of information out there because there are people who are listening to us who have hemochromatosis without knowing it. You're listening to The Dr. Joe Show, CJD 800, Newstalk Radio in Montreal. We'll be right back.